I think it's safe to say that the Eye of Sauron is one of the most iconic symbols of the fantasy genre, if not all of pop culture. So it makes sense for LEGO to dust off their Lord of the Rings theme to produce one of the most impressive icon sets to date. I'm Joe, and this is my biggest review I've done so far. This is LEGO set number 10333, the Lord of the Rings Baradur. It's only fitting that we get this set after 2023's equally fantastic Rivendell set. Because just like how the Fellowship's journey started at the bright and tranquil Rivendell, this towering dark fortress is the beacon that signifies the end of their journey to Mount Doom. So let's open up this gigantic box and see what's inside. Inside we get 40 paper bags. This is the first time seeing them in a big set like this, and I'm super happy to not get a massive pile of plastic. Well, other than the Lego bricks. And alongside the paper bags, we also get a tiny plastic one filled with a variety of exclusive helmets. We also get three instruction booklets that break up the sections of the set quite nicely, and each booklet also features a nice introduction for each section and the characters included. The build process is also made even better thanks to these little factoids scattered throughout. Finally, we get a large sticker sheet, and I have mixed feelings about this. On one hand, it's actually just 14 stickers, but most of them are so big, and big stickers make me very nervous. But I guess they're all used for the interior, so if you mess them up, it won't be too visible. And once you're finally done building this massive set, you'll end up with these extra pieces. Now, onto the set. The completed build is made up of 5,471 pieces and measures over 83 centimeters high, 45 centimeters wide and 30 centimeters deep and is clearly targeted at adult LEGO fans. I was actually surprised to find that last year's flagship Avengers Tower set is a little bit taller than Baradur, but the modular nature of the set technically does allow you to increase the height if you're willing to invest in a few extra bricks. I mentioned that there are three instruction booklets for each section of the build, but the fortress is actually made up of four sections, and I'm going to go through them one by one to match the flow of the building process. The base, on which this black mass of a tower is built, contrasts the monochrome look of the tower quite nicely, with all these trans yellow and orange pieces resembling the molten lava landscape. I like how the streams of lava are running off in between the dark orange and nougat pieces, because it gives the base a nice rough look. This particular section is also quite nice, where the colors organically blend into tan and gray bricks the higher up it goes. The designer also applied some excellent use of object source lighting at the base of the tower. By replacing the black bricks with shades of brown, it creates a nice soft gradient that makes it look like the lava is lighting up the tower, which is very clever. The front gate isn't to scale, but it does at least allow some minifigures to pass through it. There's some really nice part usage here to add some detail, like these mech fingers for the railings. The really cool part is that the doors can actually be opened together, which looks super good and is really, really fun to play with. To open the doors, you twist this well-integrated knob to the side, which activates the mechanism inside. The ground floor interior includes Gollum's hideout to the right, complete with a fishy snack, and above this area we get a little hidden spider that's probably related to Shelob. Next to that, we get the armory slash weapons forge that takes up the majority of the floor space. We get some helmets, shields and weapons, as well as a nice grindstone where the orcs can sharpen their weapons before heading up the stairs and out the front gate. To the left, we get a prison of sorts with this overcooked skeleton dangling over the lava, and the cage can also be raised and lowered by interacting with this gear piece. Above the dungeon, we get to the dining area that takes up this entire floor. But let's take a look at the exterior first. Here, we get a series of flying buttresses with some more of that brown gradient that makes it look like the light is reflecting onto the structure. The two smaller towers positioned to the sides look very cool with these spiky top sections, and I appreciate the addition of some torches to bring in a little bit more of that complementary orange tone. We also get that nice continuation of the rock face wrapping around the exterior. So dedicating a whole floor to this room feels a bit like wasted space, but the interior was never shown in the film, so I can't really fault the designer there. And besides, it's funny to see the orcs all huddle around the very messy table that's decked out with utensils, chicken legs, a sausage, and even a few empty goblets. These goblets can be filled by the keg on the left that's dripping some eerie looking green liquid. To the right we get a very nice cooking area complete with a pot that's filled with a bone and a mysterious carrot. I like the fact that Mount Doom's lava is once again utilized to cook the food. At the back we get a nice little area to prepare the meals, but my favorite part has to be the sticker that illustrates that meat is once again back on the menu. Looks like meat back on the menu, boys! Come to think of it, this iconic line is probably what inspired this entire room, but I love the idea of Sauron and the orcs gathering here for a nice company lunch. And we get another little secret to the left of this room by removing this section of the wall. 
This reveals a sticker tile with illustrations of the three elven rings, namely Vilya, Nadia, and Nenya. I really hope I pronounced that the right way. On the level above that, we have the throne room section. But again, we'll look at the exterior first, that consists mainly of that detailed rock formation. And I actually like how it sticks out at the top over here. What we can see of the tower in this section is awesome though. I especially love the addition of these two windows. Those orange plates behind the black rolls work so well to make it look like there's a fiery glow coming from the inside. The designer did take some creative license here compared to the source material, but I think it makes sense for the scale. And what was done instead is great. And on the inside, we get my favorite room of the tower. I love how the red on the banner stickers stand out against this monochrome room. We get some more of those mechanical fingers to give the throne a spiky look, and that sharp design extends into the floor pattern. I also appreciate the introduction of the light grey here to further break up the heavy use of black pieces. And this room also contains the biggest secret of the set. By pulling on this lever, a very cool secret room is revealed that houses the orb known as the Palantir. The reveal of this room is very satisfying, and I love the design of the spiky pedestal. The Palantir is made up of a printed minifigure head that's covered by a clear globe. It's the same execution as the Palantir from set 75009, The Wizard Battle, that was released in 2013, but this time we get a unique print on each side. One side showing the Shire in flames, and the other a burning white tree of Gondor. I think I actually prefer the older version, but it is nice to get these cool prints. The back walls are covered in three of the big stickers. Two of them add some depth to the room, while the middle one features a simplified map of Middle Earth. Some of the landmarks on the map include Isengard, Helm's Deep, Minas Tirith, and of course, Barad-dûr. There's also illustrations of the mouth of Sauron and Gothmog, as well as a scribbled note with the words Shire and Baggins, the two words spoken by Gollum. From this point onwards, the tower gets narrower as we move towards the Eye of Sauron. I love the doorway that leads to a balcony of sorts, again adding a splash of orange behind those grill pieces, and the use of these black A-wing tails is very clever and looks so, so good. I do have to say though that there are a few unwelcome splashes of colour in the form of these blue pieces coming through. It's impossible that no one saw this, so somehow they felt that this was good enough, but at least it's easier to swap out for black, though for the amount of money that you're spending on the set, you should not have to do that. All the sharp pieces used for detail around this section really makes the tower look very imposing, and I particularly like the row of sharp, claw-like pieces. Inside this section we get the mouth of Sauron's room. It's a bit cramped, but the designer still managed to add quite a bit of detail around the desk. To the left, we get a tile with a sticker of the mithril shirt that Frodo used to wear, and while this is sadly not printed, I am happy to say that those scrolls on the back shelf are indeed printed on window pieces. We also get two large but very nice stickers in this room. One that adds some shelves complete with a neat little easter egg of the fell beast gift with purchase set, and the other that has a portrait of Sauron holding the one ring, and I think the graphic designer did a really good job on this one. And finally, we get to the last room of the tower, the library. Most of the detail around this room is made up of stickers, which makes sense because there's a neat feature where you can rotate the ladder around to access all of the shelves. The way this is done is very cool because the floor rotates with the ladder. And on that plinth, we get a simplified version of the epigraph on a sticker. And the only way that we know that this is a black speech about the rings of power is because of the legible numbers. Before we get to the focal point of this set, I just want to show you how easily all of the sections come together to create the tower. And here it is, the Eye of Sauron, expertly designed in all of its brick build splendor. The eye stands out incredibly well against the black tower, and I love these spikes to the front, making it look even more threatening. The way the eye illuminates the tower around it works really, really well, especially with those two dual molded spikes to the sides. I am so happy that the entire eye is brick built. I don't think that a print would have done it any justice. The transition from the solid light yellow iris to the very well laid out trans yellow and orange pieces looks incredible and adds so much texture to the flaming eye. The whole thing just makes that pitch black piercing iris stand out so much more. And the eye can even look around like it does in the films, thanks to the support beam that's made up of black candle pieces. What I don't like though is the included red light brick that lights up the eye. For one, it feels a little bit tacked on at the back, and I'm not really impressed with the effect that it has. Honestly, the brown bricks and trans pieces do a way better job at recreating the eye's glow. 
Maybe the light brick could have been left on the cutting floor to shave off some of that overall cost to the consumer. Now let's move on to the minifigures starting with our two olive green orcs. Their torso prints feature some very detailed pieces of armor that extends onto their backs. I love that one is furry and the other one more spiky. The leg printing is also very good and I like that bit of chainmail hanging out. And the green printing on the metallic legs is surprisingly good. They're both wearing a recolored version of the goblin hair and pointy ear combo from the Harry Potter theme. And both facial expressions are equally nasty with those little pointy teeth. Next up we have two medium nougat colored orcs. We get some more variations of torso armor designs and once again I am extremely satisfied with these. They also have identical legs but that's fine and above all it still looks really really good. While one orc is wearing one of the many included helmet molds, the other one is sporting a nice red bandana. I'm assuming he's the cook because of his included sausage prong accessory. We also get the same head printing for both of these figs, but there's enough variety in the facial expressions to give each of them unique personalities. Next up is our one named orc, Gothmog, a lieutenant of Sauron and commander of the orcs in Osgiliath. I like how they gave him some additional chest armor to give him a bit more bulk. The printing on this piece is beautiful. Whoever did the graphic design on this set deserves a big bonus come year end. Underneath his chest armor, he's got the same armor as one of the standard orcs, but he does have the mismatched arms that's accurate to the on-screen version of the character. The printing on his head is also very good. Once again, the designer did a great job in capturing the character's deformed face, and the back is also equally nice and gross. By the time you're done building, you've actually assembled a nice army of orcs. And the best part is all of the included accessories like the Urukai blades, a hammer and prong, as well as these brand new shields that are proper scratched and rusty. Next up, we have Samwise Gamgee, who is looking way too clean and tidy for this leg of their journey to Mordor. Sadly, this is the exact same figure as the one we got in the Rivendell set. Nevertheless, it is a good looking figure. I like the short dual molded legs and his hairpiece works well, but his smiling expression feels a bit out of place. Sam also comes with a sword and the vial that Galadriel gifted to Frodo Baggins, both key accessories during their battle with Shelob. And of course, there's no Samwise Gamgee without Frodo Baggins. And everything I said about Sam applies to Frodo as well. He's just too clean and too calm apart from his milky white eyes and naturally he comes with a one ring as an accessory. The one thing that helps with the out of place face prints are these cool and very film accurate helmets we have for them. But really I feel like these two should have been given full orc armor to be more scene accurate. Rounding out our three travel companions is the tragic Gollum. And this is a brand new version of this figure with an updated body and arms as well as an updated face design with eyes that match the Lego style a little bit better. It does make him look a little bit more friendlier than usual but I like the overall design and his little painted loincloth is great. I actually totally forgot to cover this earlier but this seems like a fitting place as any. The set also comes with this rocky outcrop where Sam, Frodo and Gollum can be placed and displayed next to the tower. This is a neat little addition and I love the way that this build also includes a bit of that molten lava. And next we have my favorite minifigure of this set, the Mouth of Sauron. This is actually the second time we're seeing a minifigure of this character, the first appearance being in the Battle at the Black Gate set from 2013. Design wise very little has changed but it's definitely an upgrade. The leg and torso design is good and I like all of the silver detail that was added into the design. He also has some nice back printing but it's hidden by the included black cape. And that helmet mold is truly incredible. The spiky detail is intricate and very accurate. And it even includes the black cloth that covers most of the helmet that flows nicely into that black cape. His face printing is perfectly horrible with that large gaping mouth complete with the long yellow teeth. I also like how the face is covered by those gross wrinkles even if it's hidden by the helmet. And he even has a few grey strands of hair at the back of his head. And the mouth of Sauron also comes with a generic pearl silver sword. And finally we have the main attraction, Sauron, making his Lego debut. And man, what an entrance this figure makes. Everything about this figure is quality and expertly executed. I love that he has a full metallic silver body because it elevates his leg and torso designs so much. One thing that bugs me a little bit is how the leg printing just stops all of a sudden, but considering the overall detail of the figure, it's a minor complaint at best. He also has some back printing, but it's covered up by this cape and helmet combo. I love how the helmet and large spiked shoulder armor has been combined into one piece, and those very tall blades on his head gives the figure some needed height. The helmet's face is also nicely detailed, and those fiery eyes peeking out is excellent. That's thanks to the flaming head print underneath, which was a good bit of creative license from the designer. So in my opinion, when it comes to the new Lord of the Rings sets, LEGO is two for two. 
Baradur is a perfect follow-up to the excellent Rivendell set. And I think it was a very smart move going from a very light and optimistic set to a very dark and imposing one. Building the tower was surprisingly engaging for such a monotone set thanks to some great colour and part usage, and the various mechanisms that make the set come to life was great. And that eye was the very satisfying cherry on top. The minifigures are mostly a win for me, but I really wish the Frodo and Samwise figures were a bit more relevant to the scene. Even though the price of the set is quite high, and not a purchase you make on a whim, I mean, I blew a big chunk of my budget on this one, I do think that is justified when looking at what you get. I just hope that after two successful big sets, that LEGO would start looking at small to medium sized sets as well to make it more accessible for everyone young and old. Anyways, let me know what you think about this set and please consider liking and subscribing to the channel if you like this review and what we do. And as always, thanks for watching.